Warning. The bulk of this video deals with the opinions and criticisms of other analysts at the start of Season 5. These opinions were jossed with the release of the Cutie Remark and are no longer held by the majority of analysts mentioned or alluded to. This video is not meant to be an act of bashing, but rather using examples of other people fucking up for the purposes of education. If you are an analyst that continues to hold these opinions, well, that's on you, mate. Starlight Glimmer remains a fascinating case study, not just in how you can make a terrible character that trips over every hurdle possible to faceplant into the wet cement of failure, but also how it's possible for a large group of people to completely miss the intended point of an entire character because the power of suggestion and cultural buzzwords have overtaken their brains like a parasitic squid monster. Throughout 2017, I want to use Starlight Glimmer as a jumping off point to talk about a lot of different topics related to writing, themes, and criticism. I won't be doing it back to back, I know how tiresome it can get when I'm complaining about her, but it is a topic I do want to dedicate some time to. And today, we're gonna start with her time spent as a villain, and how so many people were wearing blinkers the entire time because Bronies are weird. Here's a good way to tell if someone in the Bronalysis community is a fucking tool if they use the word communist or Marxist anywhere near Starlight Glimmer. When the cutie map was first announced, the presence of the word equality sent a frighteningly large group of people into red scare mode, which I kind of thought that Western culture had grown out of in 2017, but then again, this is the president now, so eh, more things change, more things stay the same. The idea that equality and communism are inherently linked is one of those weird knee-jerk platitudes like violence only begets more violence, or this character that did a cool thing is a Mary Sue. It only makes sense as long as you don't think too hard about it. Communism is focused around the shared own ownership of production means and the removal of a class system. It is not a system wherein the exceptional are shunned. People with natural inclinations to various different fields of work are pretty important in any society, communism especially. The Soviet Union, which was actually a fascist police state, but I digress, created the deadliest nuclear weapon in history. I'm pretty sure they weren't the kind of people to throw away good scientists. Doing even the barest amount of research into what communism and Marxism are would render such a theory defunct almost immediately. Case in point. Before this aired, a lot of fans who saw the preview viewed this as an allegory for communism, mostly because of the equal cutie marks that everyone shares. But communism is focused on the shared ownership of production means and the elimination of class. There's no question here that Starlight's in charge, and she herself is excited to have a princess's endorsement. So making allusions to communism and Marxism in regards to Starlight Glimmer is quite frankly the dumbest thing I've ever heard in regards to Friends of His Magic. Actually, no, the second dumbest thing I've ever heard, because right alongside it, there were people saying that Starlight's town was reminiscent of cultural Marxism, also known as cultural communism or neo-Marxism. The suppression of exceptional people on the basis that differences in skill or abilities create inequality and hostility. Oh, Starlet's philosophy just ticks me off! Thing is, equality sounds nice, but newsflash, no one should be equal, otherwise no one has value. We're all equal in the sense that we are unequal, and it should stay that way. Starlight Glimmer's vision of equality is losing identity. To become equal in that manner would be to become replaceable. You might as well not exist! Now there's two problems with that assumption. Okay, actually there's a dozen problems with that assumption, but let's just focus on the two. First, that's not how equality works. Anybody worth their salt will know that equality works on the concept of equal rights and equal standing within the law, regardless of race, gender, class, orientation, or capabilities. The idea that equality refers to stripping people of their individuality is a bullshit conservative and libertarian talking point. We're gonna come back to this later. The second problem is if that diatribe sounded vaguely racist to you, that's because it is. Cultural Marxism and this interpretation of equality was coined by the Nazis as a way of denouncing Marxist ideas as part of a Jewish plot. The phrase became more popular recently after Anders Bering Breivik, the Norwegian right-wing domestic terrorist responsible for the Oslo massacre, used it in his manifesto and it became a white supremacist term to decry political correctness and multiculturalism. So if the cutie map is supposed to be a criticism of cultural Marxism, that would mean that the writers are spouting Nazi propaganda to children. And considering that most of the writers admitted to basing the town off the Nazis and fascism, it would be strange to be both criticizing the Nazis and simultaneously preaching in support of them. But then again, this is the president now, so the more things change, etc, etc, etc. So if you were an analyst making claims that this was an allegory for communism or cultural Marxism, you're either an idiot who doesn't understand what these words actually mean and you're just throwing them around without thinking about it, or you're a monster. I'll leave you to decide which one it is. 
Starlight's Town is unique to Friendship is Magic's environment. Cutie marks are the brand that determines your skills and your destiny in life. Hey assholes, there's your fucking communism metaphor. Starlight runs her town with absolute fiat and demands that everyone march in lockstep with her demands because she believes that the differences of opinion and capabilities create fights, which is only true if a, the people involved are mentally five years old, or B, the differences of opinion are so substantial that it would rightfully create a rift between them like we discussed last episode. Now, the cutie remark would later confirm that Starlight came to her philosophy entirely out of her own bitterness, but at the time of the premiere, none of this information was made available to the viewer, so a lot of people mistook the cutie map as being some kind of quasi-political theme. Were the writers trying to make a statement with this episode? And more importantly, what was that statement supposed to be? In his review of the cutie map, Cam Goes Pony remarked that the most interesting villains are the ones that kind of have a point. And while that's true in a vacuum, it doesn't apply to Starlight Glimmer. She doesn't have a point. Her entire philosophy is complete nonsense. That's not just my opinion, that's backed up within the episode itself. The town isn't thriving, it's practically devoid of any kind of life, the smiles are incredibly forced and nobody's enjoying themselves, and the minute ponies with cutie marks come in and demonstrate the flaws in Starlight's philosophy, the entire backbone of the town completely falls apart. The Looney Turtle made a similar miscalculation when he said that the writing of the cutie map unintentionally flipped the main six into the villains because they walk into the town and start forcing their beliefs on the ponies involved. This is a conclusion built not from the episode itself, but from from the internet's live and let die attitude that says that one must never tell someone that their beliefs are wrong, or miscalculated, or misinformed, or just flat out bullshit. But if you pay attention to the episode, Starlight's beliefs are challenged by the main six upon visiting and fail to hold up to scrutiny, so the ponies of that town did what any wise person does when shown proof that their current beliefs don't hold up. They changed them. Starlight's incompetence is fully on display. Her brainwashing propaganda doesn't have any effect on the main six, and they immediately come to the conclusion that Starlight will let them out if they just lie. And when her ruse is discovered, she just admits to playing everyone for a fool. The idea that people being different in any way causes disharmony is something that only she believes to the point of a deranged obsession. She's less Darth Treya and more Alex Jones. So how did Starlight get a reputation for being this brilliant villain when everything we're shown says otherwise? Well, how honest do we want to get? I've said this in the past and it bears repeating, a lot of bronies are just not very observant, and unless you beat them over the head with a theme, they're not going to pick up on it. Hell, sometimes they still won't get it even if you do beat them over the head with it. This isn't unique to bronies, some people genuinely think The Incredibles was about Ayn Rand's objectivism because a literal child and the main villain repeat something that sounds vaguely libertarian. Some people actually think 300 is a pro-Iraq war movie. I shit you not, there are people out there who think the Angry Birds movie is a critique of modern feminism. Ah, but not the real one, the imagined conservative straw man version of it. Starlight's Town is very unsubtle cult material, and the only person who actually picked up on that was Silverquill. Firebrand opted to ignore the theme entirely to make syndrome and Nazi jokes, though would later incorrectly refer to the cult as pseudo-Marxist. Cam Goes Pony would compare the cult to Harrison Bergeron, which I suppose is technically accurate, and beyond that, the majority of analysts would continue on the communism and cultural Marxism gravy trains. You remember how I pointed out earlier that cultural Marxism was Nazi propaganda, and the people who thought the episode was criticizing cultural Marxism were either not paying attention or were secretly Nazis themselves? Unsurprisingly, I favor the former. To a good critic, Starlight's behavior and mannerisms and the setup of her town will instantly ring true as a cult, and all the rhetoric becomes irrelevant as it becomes more and more clear that she's just making shit up. Unfortunately, most analysts aren't good critics, and when you're not a good critic and you see this imagery and hear this rhetoric, your mind will instantly jump to communism like your Archie Bunker, and failing that, start making connections to those two George Orwell books I bet you haven't actually read. This is compounded by the fact that the average person has no idea what Marxism actually means because that would require actually reading the books that were written by the German philosopher himself, and Marxism has become an omnipresent buzzword for conservatives and libertarians over the years to decry left-leaning politics without having to put in the effort to actually debunk it. The fact is, making connections to communist societies or Orwellian themes is such a generic thoughtless connection to make that anybody can make it and sound like they're making sense. And because so many people were making these connections, they'd begun to see things that weren't there. Are you really about to criticize other people for thinking there's implicit meaning in an episode because you know- I'm aware of the hypocrisy, Billy, but that's actually not where I'm going with that. Because people thought that the episode was making allusions to communism when the first trailer was shown, a lot of people started to see Starlight as this well-intentioned extremist with a knack for manipulation, but she wasn't either of those things. She was motivated entirely by bitterness and had all the charisma of a screaming cantaloupe. Her philosophy collapsed under the slightest challenge and she had no recourse but to run and hide from reality by the end. However, because most people thought there was some kind of cultural criticism buried in the episode itself, people were simply not paying attention and seeing only what they wanted to see, and so this one-note villain got far more attention 
attention than she rightfully deserved. This isn't the first time this has happened, mind. Some people actually think Adagio is a social Darwinist because of a few choice lyrics in Battle of the Band. However, that's not her actual philosophy. That's just what she says to get people riled up and willing to compete and fight. She lies pulling on people's competitive instinct to her own advantage. Once you start thinking about it for longer than a few seconds, the entire analysis falls apart, an analysis that wouldn't have been there had it not been for the power of suggestion. The what? The power of suggestion. When people have a predisposed assumption about something, they start seeing hints of it everywhere. I don't get it. Okay, you've seen Frozen, right? Let it go, let it go, can't hold me back anymore, let it go. I'll take that as a yes. Frozen's twist of the handsome prince being the bad guy threw a lot of people for a loop because this kind of thing is just not expected from Disney. It's a cliche, sure, but not one they tend to indulge in. Anyway, that's not the point. The first time watching Frozen, most people don't pay attention to Hans all that much for the first half of the movie. He's nice, but he's kind of bland and he's shunted aside pretty quickly. But on the second viewing, after they already know the twist ending, people pay more attention to Hans and they start noticing little details in his dialogue and how he moves that all hint to him being conniving and devious. That's the power of suggestion. You're told to look for something, and you're going to see it. Now that's Frozen, which was deliberate in that design, but the power suggestion is used a lot to make people perceive that which doesn't actually exist. You remember the panic in the 70s about how rock music contained satanic messages if you played them backwards? It was flagrantly bullshit, but it was fueled by the fact that you will hear anything playing in a song, provided you're told to look for it. Look, I'll prove it to you. Here's the infamous clip of Stairway to Heaven that's supposed to contain satanic messages when you play it backwards. <laughs> You didn't hear anything, did you? Okay, well, what if I subtitled it? You heard it that time, didn't you? I can make you hear anything. If you're predisposed to hearing or seeing something, you're going to see it. Whether that be the subtle nuances of a Disney character, Led Zeppelin singing the devil a lullaby, or a manipulative genius in this tantrum-throwing misanthrope. Now, it is worth pointing out that most analysts who were pushing the communism gravy train gave it up when the cutie remark revealed Starlight's actual motivations. I didn't lay all this out to drag the analysis community over the coals for giggles. Well, okay, not just to drag them over the coals for giggles. Merely to illustrate a point about how many people will often get carried away with first impressions and seek to confirm them. And with the benefit of hindsight, it's increasingly obvious that communist or Marxist critique was never the writer's intention. Starlight was just a very, 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 very boring villain who benefited from the knee-jerk conclusion jumping that the last 70 years of American right-wing paranoia has created in people. Despite what some people might think, I didn't actually see some kind of metaphor into where and back again when I did the season roundup. That was a hyperbolic statement mocking the cynical idea of redesigning the changelings to be more colorful. And I don't think the people who were making cultural Marxism connections to the cutie map are actually Nazis. I just think they've been misinformed by people who've made it their business to misinform them. In fact, let's play a game. If you didn't know before today that the term cultural Marxism was coined by the Nazis, tell me in the comments below. Let's see how many people learned a thing today. 